this way. This is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. We are going to discuss today COVID and school safety. And we have with us uh, one of our guests, here, uh, Paul Siegel. And as our other guests arrive later, uh, we'll join in uh, with them as well. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Okay, uh, let me see. Okay. Could you, um, sorry. Could you, uh, Paul, could you repeat that? I'm fine. How are you? Uh, very well. Oh, and uh, uh, just an FYI, uh, Paul, while we're on the air, try to avoid um, uh, calling me by name, uh, addressing me by name. Uh, Wizards on the air remain anonymous, if we can. Okay. Okay. All right, Paul. So um, tell us a little bit about your concerns uh, uh, about COVID and school safety. Okay, I, um, I, I do think we need a little bit of uh, context. So mm -hmm. um, let me try to provide that. Um, when the pandemic first hit, um, Chicago and generally the United States was completely unprepared. We were unprepared because we had gutted uh, such public health infrastructure as we had for um, several decades, um, uh, decreasing uh, huge layoffs of staff, huge closures of clinics, um, and uh, a kind of reliance on the Board of Health living from one grant application to the next and farming work out to private entities, which even the best intended um, were not equipped to do what, you, what it really takes. Um, and as a result, the, pandic, the pandemic raged somewhat out of control. The tragedy is um, the failure to um, really learn from that and take the situation in hand. That just never happened. Um, and when uh, Biden did, declared um, independence on July 4th from COVID, it really reminded me of George W. Bush strutting around on a battleship in a flak jacket, declaring victory in Iraq that, uh, of course, did not uh, exist either. Well, um, could you first tell us a little bit about your background uh, and uh, your expertise? Okay. Um, I... Um, uh, I uh, am a lifelong community-based organizer. Um, uh, that includes the fight against destabilization and displacement um, in Uptown and elsewhere in the city. Um, and for me, that branched out into the Chicago Area Black Lung Association, um, which uh, obviously involved me in a number of public health related issues, black lung being a disease that an occupational disease that affects um, people who worked in the coal mines uh, from breathing in coal dust. Um, and there were many coal field migrants in Uptown and I better not get into that story because that could go all day. Um, and uh, also that involved me in a number of other grassroots um, uh, community public health kinds of campaigns against lead poisoning in the buildings in Uptown. Um, uh, we took on TB when it reared its ugly head in the 1990s and did school-based um, testing and education around TB. Um, uh, uh, so those are just a few examples. Um, I'm not a medical expert. I didn't go to medical school. I don't have a degree in public health, um, but my involvement um, at the grassroots level in public health um, is long and, and goes somewhat deep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then um, what, uh, what initiated you to um, work on COVID and school safety? Well, as I said, um, we were totally unprepared for this pandemic. Um, uh, under the Harold Washington administration, there were advances, you know, that's back in the 19, mid 1980s, there were advances being made in public health in this city that built upon grassroots struggles, 
like when the original Rainbow Coalition, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, and the Young Patriots started free health clinics and shamed the city of Chicago um, uh, uh, into opening uh, new neighborhood board of health uh, health centers. Um, what happened and, to the Young Lords uh, medical uh, clinics and huh, the other ones? Say that again. What happened to the Young Lords and uh, the other uh, Black Panthers uh, medical clinics? Um, it, I think it has to be understood that the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords and the Young Patriots, which was uh, poor white um, youth, primarily from uptown, were uh, a tremendous repression was visited upon them. They were young people struggling to do that with no resources. There were great successes. They had mass community campaigns around all kinds of health issues. Um, and again, shame the city into starting the neighborhood health centers. So due to a combination of repression of their organizations um, and the fact that um, the city had finally did set up uh, neighborhood health centers, um, that led to a decline in those uh, health clinics, but their contribution cannot be overstated. I mean, do as you, I said, the mass- do you know, mm -hmm. Yes, do you know of any members of that organization and are they still active in the community today? Um, a number of ex-Black Panther Party members are still active. Um, uh, there's uh, Billy J. Brooks, Stan McKee, Henry Nesbitt, John Preston. Um, young patriots, um, uh, Southern whites tended to, um, uh, because of urban renewal policies that made it uh, very difficult uh, to afford to live in uptown and, and a wave of arson profit, a lot of the Appalachian whites um, that were in uptown moved out. Um, a brother named Hy Thurman who was very much a part of the Young Patriots in the 60s in Uptown, has refounded the Young Patriots and lives in Huntsville, Alabama, um, and Could works you on- Could back up a little bit? Uh, it was a little bit of uh, um, clarity over there. Uh, did you say something about profits? And did you say something about arson? It uh, sounded like arson and profits. Uh, could you just- uh, yeah, arson for profit. Um, arson for profit. Yeah, there was a master plan um, uh, that was developed by something called the Uptown Chicago Commission, which was an, uh, an elite business and kind of gentry um, run so-called community organization um, that was founded in the 50s. And since the early 60s, they had really had developed a master plan to, to re-gentrify, that is to um, replace uh, the army, of the huge, a uh, multiracial cauldron of low-income people that came about in Uptown for a number of historical reasons um, uh, and replaced them with affluent, primarily white people. Uh, it's a very long story, which I don't think we can go into today, but part of that horrible process of uh, displacing thousands of people um, was first that slumlords would buy up buildings knowing that the plan of the city and the civic elites was for those uh, buildings no longer to exist as low income buildings. Um, so they would just, the kind of person that would take over the building um, would just bleed the building and you had lead poisoning and all kinds of terrible health hazards, um, real serious public health issues in those buildings. And then they started to burn. And we lost about 40 lives in Uptown in the 19, late 60s, 70s, and 80s due, uh, due to arson for profit, especially mm -hmm. in the late 60s through the 70s. Um, that is, uh, those 40 casualties are only a small part of the casualties in what I call a real estate war. Um, to gentrify the community. People fought back in Uptown. Uptown became the place uh, where there was the, mo the biggest mass movement to resist displacement um, uh, uh, because everybody that was in Uptown had been displaced from somewhere else. And it was a multiracial um, island in a sea in the most segregated city in the United States. Um, and uh, th there remain, you know, some victories were won, 
150 units of scattered site housing, preservation of Section 8 housing in a number of large apartment buildings, uh, some cooperatively owned housing and housing owned by nonprofit house uh, organizations like Voice of the People, of which I'm vice president of the board. Um, and that community still exists in much smaller form and continues to fight for justice in Uptown. Hmm. Um, you know, thank you so much for the context. Also, um, uh, let's uh, let's uh, clarify uh, something else as well. Isn't the uh, lead piping very widespread uh, in the city? And uh, doesn't the uh, lead pipe uh, lead lead pipes also exist in uh, in uh, all housing, not only uh, uh, low income housing and uh, um, housing that is uh, um, being that is being neglected, even. Uh, well-maintained uh, homes and uh, of middle-class families, don't those homes also contain lead piping? That's absolutely correct. And um, uh, we need to replace all those. Um, it's just another example of uh, the city um, trying to get by on the cheap. Uh, for instance, failing to buy, um, to purchase HEPA filters and assure six fresh air changers um, uh, per hour in all the classrooms in the city. Instead, getting by on the cheap with, with another kind of filter, I'm not sure of the name, which has not been certified by any recognized experts as really effective. Um, uh, that is an example, another example of uh, the austerity that continues, the gutting of public health the failure to understand and the failure to understand the nature of this crisis. Um, uh, we have a situation in Chicago right now where um, the communities that that low income CPS students live in are in most cases um, less than 50 percent vaccinated. We have a situation where 12 to 18 year olds are only about 30% vaccinated. We have a situation where five to 11 year olds are completely unvaccinated. Take those facts and what do they add up to when you reopen schools? They add up to schools as incubators of the Delta variant, which is notoriously terribly, terribly, terribly um, contagious. Um, schools as incubators where kids will kind of trade the virus around to each other, bring it home to their 50% unvaccinated communities. Um, there is in effect a grand experiment, kind of a kind of experiment going on with the lives of our children. And in some ways that started in the current phase. It's been going on since the pandemic started. But in the current phase, it started when the CDC outrageously stopped, decided that it would not fully track breakthrough infections, breakthrough infections being uh, COVID infections um, that happened to people despite the vaccination. And they did it on the grounds that um, the vast majority would not be sick or hospitalized, and they didn't really need to track them. And then they further went on and said, if you're vaccinated, go ahead, go, you know, go eat in restaurants without, you know, be without a mask, go to bars, go to parties, have a great old time. Our president has declared independence from COVID. Yeah, no, no more effective than Bush declaring victory in, in Iraq was that. Um, and, and in fact, what we are now seeing, um, it's true, it's absolutely, let me make it clear, um, there's no, uh, one of the most important weapons in our arsenal is vaccination, and everybody should be vaccinated. And it is extremely important and very in fact, uh, effective in controlling the disease. But to not track the infections, and now we're seeing the emergence of long haul COVID, where, where as many as one out of every five people who gets infected and often is asymptomatic will six weeks later begin to show um, begin to show symptoms that may be with them for the rest of their lives. We don't know. It's all a grand experiment with our lives and the school system um, has terribly failed us. We want every school open for vaccinations 12 hours a day, seven days a week. We want 
social distancing at least six feet when the school is willing to settle for three feet if they can do it. Um, we want, um, uh, they finally agreed to masks because of the huge pressure. Um, uh, and we want that five to 11 year olds cannot be in the schools unvaccinated. There has to be effective online learning um, uh, uh, created. Um, and we need financial support for people who get infected with COVID ch school children, uh, financials and have to quarantine financial support for the families who have to stay home. And we need a massive program of education and vaccination to get everyone vaccinated. Had we done that months and months ago. Had we done that months ago, you wouldn't have the problem now of the breakthrough infections. You wouldn't have, you know, you, the Delta variant wouldn't have had enough warm bodies to, to evolve in um, as something so dangerous and something so contagious. So we have authorities who are still enamored of just leaving it up to private corporations and private philanthropists to take care of public health, who fail to take on the real responsibility that they have and who in effect are, 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 have their ears plugged up and their eyes covered and they hear no evil, speak no evil and see no evil. We are facing a terrible crisis if schools are reopened under the conditions that CPS plans to do. Oh, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the um, uh, Black Panthers shamed the city into opening more health clinics. But after the uh, Black Panthers and uh, their medical clinics closed, how many of the city uh, clinics closed and how, how long after uh, the Black Panthers clinics closed that the, the city closed their uh, medical clinics? From what number to what number do we have now? What I'm saying is that after the death of Harold Washington, who was increasing public health in the city, who was building upon those victories that happened in the 70s, who was building in the mid 80s upon those victories and making public health better and more effective and had, um, uh, Howard can give us the exact numbers who just came on, but I believe about 2000 employees at the height. Um, after post, Post-1987, when Harold died, um, we began to see the cuts down to 500 employees um, and vast numbers of clinics closed, most recently the mental health clinics in the city. And then you had a stopgap kind of replacement with federally qualified health centers, usually contracted out to often very good, well-meaning nonprofits who will admit to you that they're not equipped to do the massive effort that it would take to cope with, with a pandemic. So we have a whole ordinance that would rebuild called the take the vaccine to the people ordinance that would rebuild public health. Um, if, but uh, perhaps you wanna focus on the schools, it's up to you where you wanna take this discussion. And Howard's here and uh, he can fill in some of those stats. Uh, I know you missed some of what I said, Howard, so the risk is you may repeat a few things, but. That's okay, uh, Paul, yeah, just, thank you so much for the context. Yes, Howard, uh, uh, go ahead. I was going to- Yeah, just to answer your, just to answer your question, uh, I just wanna show you something. Uh, I think you can see the second floor here of the Daily Center. That entire second floor was occupied uh, by administrators uh, and frontline health workers uh, during Harold Washington's administration, actually before that. So to specifically answer your question, uh, when, Mayor Daley uh, was first elected in 1989, uh, we had 57 different facilities. Uh, of those 57 facilities, there were 21 mental health clinics. There were seven what we call neighborhood health centers. Those are larger buildings uh, that are still owned by the city, uh, but as Paul said, have been privatized. Uh, we had lots of maternal child health clinics. Almost all the WIC sites uh, were, were Department of Health sites, and we had over 2,000 employees. Uh, as Paul said, we are now down to 13 facilities, less than 500 workers. So that's a drop of 300% uh, from 2,000 to 500. Uh, and then we only have uh, no more direct patient care being given to the Department of Health. 
One of the things that's crucial to understand about this pandemic everywhere, including in the United States and Chicago, is that in order to effectively manage it, you have to have the integration of two hands. One hand is the public health side. That's the hand out in the community, out in the workplace, out in the schools, that is what we call population-based health. The other hand is the people who are being taken care of inside brick and mortar buildings like hospitals and clinics and nursing homes. If these two hands are not adequately staffed and working together, then you have a disaster, which is what we're in right now. Um, so that's what happened to the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, there was a recent article, I, I think it was in WBEZ this last week, uh, maybe WTTW, I don't remember. And it said very specifically that this commissioner and the commissioner behind, before her, who is Julie Morita, who is now the vice president of basically the Robert Wood of the Robert Wood Foundation, depending on the year, the first or second largest health foundation in the United States, specifically have privatized all new jobs, have contracted out on the excuse that the hiring process of the city is too long. Uh, that's an absolute lie. They have emergency powers, as does the mayor and every commissioner, to hire people within a few weeks uh, temporarily while they're processing their papers. This is what we did under Harold Washington. This could still be done now. But the neoliberal agenda of Daly, Emanuel, and Lightfoot basically does the opposite and has put this city on a, on a disaster course, which it's reached a long time ago. First of all, uh, Howard, could you give us a, a little background about your expertise? Yes, uh, my name is Dr. Howard Ehrman. <clears throat> Uh, in 1969, I was asked by Fred Hampton, who I knew previously uh, from high school, actually, and Ronald Doc Satchel, who was the Minister of Health of the Black Panther Party, to work with them and many other people uh, to develop the part of the Rainbow Coalition that was called the Rainbow Health Coalition. Uh, this coalition consisted of nine organizations, uh, some of which you know about, the Young Lords, uh, the Black Panthers, the Young Patriots, but also some churches in Englewood on the south side. Uh, we did two things. We did, took this model uh, from Cuba uh, and from China at that time. China's model is very different now, where we integrated uh, what we call primary health care, so people could walk in to free clinics all over the city, uh, nine of them. And we also did community outreach. We went door to door uh, with everything for blood pressure to sickle cell testing. We went into the schools across the street from the Jake Spurgeon Winters uh, clinic that the Panthers started at 16th and Springfield, uh, two blocks from there is where Dr. Martin Luther King lived in 1966. Uh, we went in to a elementary school, a CPS elementary school, and for the first time in the history of the United States, tested every child uh, for sickle cell anemia. That was the first thing that we ever did. I went to medical school at the University of Illinois at Chicago uh, at Cook County, I did a residency first in family medicine, uh, then part of a residency in occupational environmental health. I became a primary care doctor for the Department of Health, um, went on to University of Southern California to become a faculty member professor, came and was invited back by Harold Washington to become the assistant commissioner from 1985 until 1991 when I couldn't take daily anymore. Uh, I was the chief medical officer uh, for Will County during the Ebola uh, epidemic a few years ago. Uh, and in between times for 30 years, I was a faculty member at both Cook County and the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, I'm you, still on the fact. Were you yeah. uh, in, in charge of uh, increasing the employees for, to 3,000 3, under here at Washington? To increase? No, no, the no. Employees for so, health. No, no, no. The, so, so, <clears throat> the employees probably increased a couple hundred under here at Washington. The health department, even under the old Mayor Daley, was much bigger than it, than it is now. So we did increase uh, a number of positions. We increased public health nursing who went out in the community. We increased public health nursing aides, which are now called like community health workers, by recruiting them from those um, African-American Latino communities most in need. Uh, we increased the staff for maternal child health to deal with maternal and infant mortality and morbidity. Um, so we increased the staff for WIC, uh, but the staff was actually much bigger, um, you know, uh, at that time. And that was true of all public health departments. Chicago was not an exception. 
what's important to understand is that in 1980 to 2020, over those 40 years, we lost 100,000 public health workers, almost exclusively in local and state health departments. But no city devastated its health department more than Chicago, just like no city closed more public housing and destroyed it than Chicago. No city closed more public schools and no city cut back more public transit than Chicago. Chicago has destroyed the public sector more effectively than any other neoliberal Democrat or Republican mayor. Well, first of all, let me uh, clarify something else. Uh, is the Rainbow Coalition connected with the Rainbow Push Coalition? No, absolutely okay. not. Okay. Uh, the, the, so the, the, if you go online, you can watch the, the PBS uh, special from mm -hmm. last year about the original Rainbow Coalition. Uh, there is no connection whatsoever except for a couple words in the name. Okay. Then the second uh, question will be, uh, since um, the city, the city of Chicago decimated uh, the uh, medical services and, uh, and, uh, and everything else, did you say public transportation as well? Yes, the city of Chicago in 1997 and 1998 did something that no other city has done since World War II to today. Uh, first, in 1997, it cut 20% of all bus service almost exclusively in black and brown neighborhoods. Then in 1998, it cut 20% of the CTA train service. So prior to 1998, every one of the train lines uh, had 24 seven service. They had conductors um, beginning in 1998, they cut the 24 hour service on all the lines except for the red line and the Forest Park O'Hare blue line. And they began to cut back conductors which they eliminated within a few years after that. Uh, that's just some of the example of what happened. Uh, at that time, we provided the city with data, a large coalition on public transit uh, that showed that certain uh, trains and certain bus lines that were primarily white on the north sides in the suburbs didn't get cut back, whereas other trains and buses that had much higher ridership did get cut back in African-American Latino neighborhoods. So uh, who was the, uh, responsible for making those decisions? And then uh, uh, how, how are they held accountable for those decisions? Uh, the person responsible was Mayor Richard M. Daley uh, for both the public transit and the destruction of 25,000 units of public housing. Uh, when I was standing five to 10 feet away from Mayor Daley um, in 1989 at his first press conference, and the first thing he said was, there are too many poor people in Chicago. He did the most effective job of any mayor in the history of the United States to get rid of them. Of course, that's a code word for there's too many uh, black and brown people in Chicago. So he's responsible for that. Uh, the closing of schools is a responsibility of his and as you know, uh, Mayor Emanuel. Um, and in terms of the health department, uh, he was primarily responsible with his commissioners that he put in specifically to begin to downsize so it's not just a question of cutbacks, it's a question of cutbacks and privatization to primarily nonprofits. Yesterday, there was a major article I would really encourage everybody on this call to read uh, in the Washington Post. It was put up about six o'clock last night. It explains that the federal government and many state governments completely privatized the whole vaccine plan to people who have never done vaccines before. Uh, this is one of the reasons that the entire vaccine rollout under Biden has been as big of a disaster as it was under Trump. This is WCRD Chicago 88.3 FM. And we have with us on Blizzard, Dr. Howard Ehrman and Mr. Paul Siegel, a community activist. Dr. Ehrman. Uh, since um, let's say that um, uh, by Biden, the Biden administration privatized uh, the vaccinations, if, um, the vac if the vaccinations do not uh, cover as much, um, are, not as, are not implemented well, who is responsible, who is accountable if, uh, if people are, are not uh, vaccinated as they could be and uh, people die from that? Well, the people who are accountable are the people you see on television. So that starts with President Biden. That's where the buck starts. Uh, it includes his advisors on the uh, 
the COVID team. So um, that includes people who are, are you know, well-respected people but are doing the wrong thing. It includes the head of the CDC, Dr. Julie Walensky, who actually criminally told people to take their masks off May 13th, and she is responsible for the deaths of thousands of people since then and tens of thousands of infections. Uh, so those are some of the people responsible. It includes the governor of Illinois, whose name is J.B. Pritzker, who basically privatized contact tracing and has not done the right thing uh, through his uh, health director, Dr. Azike, uh, with the question of how to best distribute vaccines. It also includes the mayor of Chicago and her so-called health commissioner, uh, Dr. Arwadi, who basically has done things worse than any other city. Uh, to give you some examples, every permanent site the city ran was closed July 28th, a month ago, and replaced by in-home vaccinations that you can only get between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. So hundreds of thousands of primarily African-American Latino workers are supposed to stay home from work, lose their job to get a vaccine. That's not the way to do it. When, uh, let's say that, uh, so there, you say that there's no other, uh, they don't, they're not accountable for anything if people die except if the voters vote them out, there, there uh, are no consequences for their decisions then. Let's say for- a Well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna kick it, I'm gonna kick it back to Paul because Paul has a long stellar history as a great organizer. Um, and I think he understands as well or better than I do what has to be done to change the situation. So I'd like, I wanna have Paul answer that. I, I, well, I would say, first of all, uh, as to that immediate question, there's a couple of other things I'd like to cover coming off what Howard said, but um, I think that's very clear. The, um, the whole history of this pandemic is um, that the only, the only accountability um, that, the, that any of those powerful public officials um, uh, have is the accountability that the people enforce upon them. Um, and that goes um, from uh, whatever disruption it takes to make them do the right thing um, to elections, um, but they don't, um, they don't get sued. They don't go to jail um, if people die because of their uh, public health policies. That's just chalked up as, as kind of a loss. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, clearly the only accountability is the accountability that the people organize together and force upon them. Um, I just want to also point out that um, what Howard said about the whitening of the city and the destruction of public housing um, and too many poor people, this is, I want to make sure that people understand, this is something that continues to go on today. And I want to give just one example, um, and it, it relates to health also, because in Uptown, um, there's a hospital in the community called Weiss Hospital, um, uh, which uh, was taken over by an outfit called Pipeline, which already has a vast record throughout the country of taking over hospitals, uh, making money off of them, and then destroying them and closing them. Um, and... Um, Pipeline has taken over Weiss, um, and now a parking lot that Weiss says it doesn't need anymore um, with the collusion of uh, Uptown's gentrifying uh, and morally and polit politically bankrupt alderman James Kappelman, um, uh, what we have is um, uh, uh, that uh, Pipeline conveniently sold that to Lincoln Properties which is a racist gentrifying developer um, that has been sued for racism in various parts of the country. And they plan to build some 300 units of completely unaffordable luxury housing in a community um, where this alderman has already put luxury unaffordable housing on every square inch of land that he can find. And by having that right virtually on top of uh, a, a hospital, where they used to have a parking lot for the hospital, um, you can see the writing on the wall. We're looking at 
um, the likely closure of a public health facility and its replacement by gentrification on the lakefront. It's right, you know, it's on Marine Drive right near the lake. Um, uh, 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 and and the um, con and the further whitening of Uptown. Remember what I said. Uptown was this anomaly, this island of a multiracial community of people working and struggling together in the most segregated city in the country that is becoming more and more whitened by the policies of uh, in the 46th ward, which are policies that are prevailing throughout the city. Um, uh, so I so, uh, uh, Paul, I that's so why lives are then expen are so expendable in terms of uh, the public health situation. So Paul, are these policies illegal? Are, um, are what they are um, putting into place, they are, are they illegal or oh, are they uh, not legal, but uh, going ahead anyway? That's an excellent question. Are they illegal? Is racial segregation illegal? It's a very interesting question. Um, um, uh, we, in Uptown, we filed a lawsuit called the Avery suit in the 1970s, uh, charging a conspiracy of a private developer named Bill Thompson, the, uh, uh, the federal um, H. HUD, and the city of Chicago, a conspiracy to take one of the few integrated cities, uh, neighborhoods in the city and turn it into a luxury, all white segregated neighborhood. And the judge ruled that that was a legal issue um, for a number of reasons, all kinds of reasons. Um, we, we had to kind of wind up settling without res totally resolving the case. Um, so there is, some legal precedent for saying that's illegal, but is there a law against gentrification? I'm very sorry to say no. Whatever laws we have on the books right now that supposedly protect affordable housing in Chicago, in my opinion, in my view, uh, represent a treadmill that paradoxically leads somewhere. It's a treadmill in the sense that you keep getting way more luxury housing um, proportionate to any new affordable housing so that you're on a treadmill and losing ground. But paradoxically, paradoxically, it's a treadmill that leads somewhere, namely out of the city for poor people and people of color. In other words, you have an, afford uh, uh, an ARO ordinance uh, uh, to protect affordability that goes for a paltry 10%. Could you, uh, yeah, could you explain ARO just in case some uh, listeners don't understand ARO? Huh. I'm sorry. Could you um, explain what ARO ordinance is? Right. What it does, I was just saying, it, and what it does is it, it, it provides for a paltry 10% um, when there's a luxury development that 10% uh, of, those, uh, of those units should be affordable. And then kind of similar, similarly to uh, pollution credits that the, the developer can buy his way out of it. Uh, by putting money into some kind of low-income housing trust fund, which is neither here nor there and doesn't guarantee protecting the neighborhood in which the luxury housing is being afforded, protect, uh, being built. Um, and so um, by saying this is how we protect affordable housing, it's the opposite because you get more and more and more luxury housing with the excuse that a handful of, of affordable units are gonna also be built and the, and the imbalance and the segregation of the city and the driving of people out of, people out of the city continues. And it's a public health problem. People are losing their, uh, uh, people are, are, the homelessness increases with gentrification and homelessness um, uh, uh, leads to people having to crowd into shelters. Um, it leads to people not having any access at all to health care. It leads to COVID. It leads to death. Um, you, uh, yes, yes. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that there was an outcome to that lawsuit. Are you allowed to disclose the details? But you could just tell us well, briefly. The, no, the, the outcome of the lawsuit that we settled was that we got... Um, um, uh, Instead of, of you know, instead they were going to build uh, two gigantic luxury twin tower high rises um, on Montrose and Sheridan, and 
luxury, fancy, um, for very affluent people shops to go and buy all your little trinkets in. And instead, we got a lower apartment building with 20% Section 8 for 20 years. And we got um, a jewel Osco that the community was able to use that still stands there today. And we got um, a, a partial Section 8s at some of the other buildings. And we got a low-income housing trust fund that was able to get one building, 927 Wilson, that's now owned by Voice of the People, that's completely affordable. And then we dovetailed uh, the, the Avery suit um, with the Gautreaux suit, which was a famous suit that, that went on for many, many years, saying that public housing was segregating the city. Um, uh, and the idea of Gautreaux was to require the city to build public housing in white neighborhoods. And that put the aldermen uh, and the corrupt city in a terrible position because they uh, thrive on stirring up racism. Um, and uh, they thrive on saying, we'll keep your neighborhoods ethnically pure on the northwest side where all the cops and firemen live and whatnot. So what we did was we said, well, Uptown is still majority white. Um, and uh, although it was, as I say, multiracial, um, it was about 50% white at the time, we'll take scattered site, family, low income, CHA, publicly owned housing in Uptown. And we made it part of the settlement. Um, so we got 150 units of scattered site housing. It's a drop in the bucket. Um, and, uh, and you mentioned too that uh, compared what, to the thousands of units that were lost, but it did preserve some kind of a community. Um, uh, and uh, that, you know, it's very complicated, but with the death of Harold Washington and what was happening in the city and what kind of resources were available, we couldn't keep the lawsuit going forever. We did win something. And I do want to recommend that everybody consider the idea that gentrification should be illegal because it because it promotes segregation, which is supposed to be illegal under the Civil Rights Act. You said that uh, you um, the outcome was that you had 20 years of uh, affordable housing. So how many years till that 20 years is up? Oh, uh, that's um, the, uh, those 20 years are up. Um, uh, but the 105th, that was in you know, some of the buildings that the developer was able to build, but still have the 150 units of scattered site housing uh, publicly owned. We still have the building at 927 Wilson um, that is low income. And we still have, um, uh, we still, uh, another struggle that was, that was waged coming off of it to preserve section eight what's called project-based Section 8 housing in large apartment buildings um, uh, that were built uh, with help from HUD in the 1960s, um, but that um, in exchange for which they, you know, for the government help, uh, the developers had to provide um, affordable housing there for 20 years. And then when those 20 years were coming up, they of course wanted to sell it on the market to gentrify. Uh, the community organized a campaign and fought hard and hundreds of units of Section 8 uh, low-cost housing were preserved. Um, so, you know, it's been a very, very tough fight in Uptown. Um, and what we were able to do was keep some kind of community here, which continues to struggle. Um, but um, uh, the suffering that they've caused, the war- What, what, what was your tool? What was your tool to preserve that, uh, those uh, hundreds of units of scattered site housing? Say that again? What was your tool? What, what was the basis that oh, you were well, able to? You know, they're, they're government owned. And um, once they were built, um, uh, nothing's ever totally secure, but they, they weren't built with any kind of 20 year limit. That's government owned public housing. As Howard pointed out, that, that which the government gives, the government can take. So mm -hmm. the government got rid of a lot of low income housing. Um, but not, uh, not those 150 units. And that's because the community has remained organized and continued to fight. Mm -hmm. Howard, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, a lot of um, uh, public health was privatized, uh, such as vaccinations, et cetera. Uh, could you tell us if it were not uh, uh, privatized, how better, uh, if it were public, how better would it be uh, uh, versus what it is now? 
Would more people get va uh, uh, vaccinated, uh, better testing? Uh, what is the difference after it's, uh, it was privatized? Thank you so much for that question, Trudy. And I, I forgot to thank you for just having us on in general. Um, after I answer this though, I really wanna get back to the question of schools uh, mm -hmm. because this is actually the most important thing right now that's going on in terms of the greatest risk to the greatest number of people. So let me try to answer your question. I'm gonna talk about four dates in history, one of which is in Chicago. Um, on May 17th, 1963, um, when I was, let's see, how old was I? I was 15 uh, and it was 10 years after I got polio and I was paralyzed from the waist down for six months. The city of Chicago vaccinated 363,000. That's three, six, three, zero, zero, zero people in 18 hours on a Sunday, 363,000 people. Everyone lived within two to three blocks of a vaccine station of which there were hundreds of them. Here's, it was all done by the Chicago Department of Public Health. Here were the vaccine stations, uh, Trudy. Every public school, almost every Catholic school every church, every park district field house, and dozens and dozens of bars and saloons were vaccine stations, and people's vegetable carts. Uh, there were people who still had horse and, you know, horses drawing vegetable carts in the city. Um, there were like hundreds and hundreds of these vaccine stations. 363,000 people in one day. The Department of Health and all of its other people so far um, have barely touched that number, um, you know, in terms of vaccinating people. Um, and they've been the, doing it for nine months. So that's the first thing. What the second the location, thing- What were the locations of that one day when uh, uh, there was that, the 363 vaccinations? What were the sites? I, I just told you. The sites were within two or three blocks of where everybody in the city lived. Every public school, mm -hmm. every Catholic school, every church and probably synagogues, I don't, I don't know about mosques, um, every, every park district field house, um, those were all open. Every city and state building, uh, this was mostly done outside because the weather was good. So there were hundreds and hundreds of locations. So, so the that process next, could be repeated that, now too. So that process is- uh, Yeah, those, those, the, right those, that process is repeatable. In 1850, so it's 171 years ago, the state of Massachusetts began to open schools as vaccine sites. And from 1850 until now, the most successful permanent sites ever anywhere in the world, including the United States and Chicago, are schools because people, despite their problems, feel positive about schools. They trust schools to a certain extent. They may not like the Board of Education uh, or whatever, but they, that's where they send their kids. So there's a high level of trust. So 1850, schools were open, not just for students, but for everyone, okay? In 2009 and 2010, just 10 years ago, the four states in the United States that opened up the most schools vaccinated the most number of people for H1N1, when there was an H1N1 uh, epidemic slash pandemic. Um, so that's the second date. The third date is 1888. That's when Jane Adams and her colleagues in Hull House uh, went, they had been working for years in the first ward, what we, you know, it's called the first ward then, uh, within a mile and a half or two of Hull House and recruited women from every block not too many men, but mostly women, to become not just educators to educate people about smallpox vaccine, but to be vaccinators. And so they basically then vaccinated thousands and thousands of people, which was then repeated by the Chicago Board of Health all over the city to stop a major smallpox epidemic here in Chicago. How many people uh, did they so vaccinate those about? Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I think it was, it was a couple hundred thousand. I mean, Chicago's mm -hmm. population was much less than it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's that. Then the last date 
this is very important because this is the number one place that the diseases, all infectious diseases are transmitted besides schools. And that date is 1894. In 1894, again, Florence Kelly, Dr. Alice Hamilton, um, who is the founder, worldwide founder of occupational workers medicine, uh, all lived at Hull House. And they convinced the governor of Illinois, who was probably the most uh, progressive governor in the history of the United States, John Peter Altgeld, to deputize them, uh, starting with Florence Kelly, who did the most of anybody to stop child labor in the United States and the world, uh, to clean up sweatshops uh, and then factories in the stockyards, because the sweatshops like Hart, Schaffner, and Marx, and, and Chicago had hundreds of sweatshops then, uh, were making clothes and the workers had smallpox and the the clothes can transmit smallpox, particularly wool. So the governor agreed to this and they began to do mass vaccination of thousands and thousands of workers in the workplace. This is exactly the opposite of what's happening now. So all these things were done through public health departments primarily once they got started until this pandemic when the entire process has been privatized um, 40 years after public health departments were decimated. So instead of hiring hundreds of thousands of public health workers in this country, every contract has been privatized. So for example, the testing was always done by public health departments. That was privatized in most states. The contact tracing after somebody tests positive was done by public health departments. That was privatized everywhere in the, most places in the United States. Now the vaccines, which is the most important thing that's on people's minds. For the first time in history, the government of the United States, instead of the way it always did things previously. So the CDC, since World War II, it's existed. It didn't exist before then. The CDC directly was responsible for distributing all vaccines, not just during epidemics, pandemics, and outbreaks, but all vaccines all the time to state and local public health departments. That's who they distributed to. Then each state and public health department has the responsibility to directly distribute that to both public providers and private providers like hospitals and in the last 15 years, pharmacies. One thing that's important for your listeners to understand is pharmacies never, and pharmacists could not do vaccinations until the last 15 or 20 years in any state because it, they just weren't trained for that. So that's been a huge sea change in the last couple of decades. So now what happened is Trump, as you remember, for the first time bypassed the CDC and made a direct contract with the world's two largest pharmacies, CVS and Walgreens, to directly um, send them vaccines. Now, originally the vaccines were still going through the local and the state health departments to the Walgreens and CVS. But guess who changed that process? President Joseph Biden got into office and he said, oh, that's not efficient enough. So now we're gonna bypass completely, in our case, the Illinois Department of Public Health or Cook County Department of Public Health or Chicago Department of Public Health. And we're gonna send the greatest number of doses to Walgreens and CVS. So during this pandemic, the greatest number of doses by far has not gone to public health departments. It's gone to Walgreens and CVS. Then the last thing to understand is that the most vulnerable people, the people in nursing homes and long-term care facilities were always given vaccines like flu shots every year by the public health departments for the most part. Well, Trump developed this contract with CVS and Walgreens to do all of them. And instead of changing that, when Biden took office, in the first month, he could see that they were terrible at doing that. They were very inefficient. They weren't paying attention to African-American and Latino, predominantly uh, people of color in nursing homes. They did them last. Instead of changing that, he made it worse. So this privatization of vaccines has been a complete disaster on top of other disasters we can talk about later of how vaccines were done. I would like to just um, uh, interject, um, and in a sense, it's been covered, but just imagine, you know, this giving, giving the vaccines to the pharmacies. 
Just imagine for a minute if every single public school in the city of Chicago, every single public school was open 12 hours a day, staffed by public health nurses and nurses assistants um, to give vaccines to uh, anybody that comes in. And imagine if you also, instead of uh, giving um, COVID monies to an over already over bloated police department, while CDP, while the Chicago Department of Public Health um, exists by asking philanthropists for grants, imagine if you use that money to hire vast numbers of community residents, community grassroots leaders to be going block by block. Um, offering vaccines to those um, too infirm to go out to the schools and, and educating people, um, I got the vaccine, here's why it's safe, here's why, it, here's why I'm happy that I got it, you know me, I look like you, um, uh, I'll tell you, all this talk about hesitancy, it would become a minor nuisance at the most. Imagine if that's what we did in this city, and that's the public health infrastructure that, that Howard and I are talking about, that the People's Response Network is talking about. That's what has to be taken on, and only through a mass movement can be done. The last thing, I just want to throw this in. Um, I just want to throw this into the mix. Think about vaccines for a minute. Vaccines are, are an oasis, really, of communal, mass, collective um, measures for taking responsibility for our lives um, and, 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 make, and making our lives healthy. That's what vaccinations are. They're mass collective efforts, and they are an oasis of that, of, of collective responsibility and collective rights and collective liberation in a vast, vast desert of individualism that is promoted um, in relation to healthcare, plastic surgery for the very wealthy to, to, to look like they're young forever. They, they, um, and, all, and everything that is done to promote individualism and me and me only um, by the powers that be who profit from that kind, kind of consumer culture. So consider what vaccination really is if it's done in the way that Howard was talking about. Well, maybe how we could help clarify uh, why we are in this situation. Howard, could you uh, uh, give us a little uh, breakdown about the prices? Uh, let's say that um, for uh, testing, uh, one test, uh, uh, under uh, the public health department cost how much versus the privatized test uh, cost how much. And contact tracing, one uh, uh, contact tracing in the public sector uh, would, uh, in the public sector would cost how much and in the private sector, sector would uh, cost how much. And finally, the vaccines, one vaccine uh, in, uh, under, public, in, under the public sector would cost how much versus how much would it cost under the private when it, when it has been privatized. Yeah, thank you for those excellent questions. And I'll be happy to answer that in a minute or two. But we really need to focus right now, a week before schools are opening, on putting those in the context of schools. So to start off with the topic we were discussing, vaccines, uh, there was one public official, one public official in this country who did mostly the right thing around this major, major pandemic. And that was the superintendent of schools of the second largest school district in the United States, Los Angeles Unified School District, um, with 700,000 uh, students, literally exactly twice as big as Chicago and a little bit less than New York. So here's what he did, uh, Superintendent Butner. He is the only, it is the only school system in the United States that massively tested students who were not symptomatic. Um, this is really important. When you hear the lies that come out of the mouths of multiple public officials at the federal, state, and local levels, 
and the lies that come out of the mouths of so-called scientists and infectious disease experts, including Dr. Julie Walensky, the head of the CDC, that there is no basis to say there were uh, major outbreaks in schools. This is very important um, in terms of why schools cannot be open now. In order to make that statement and understanding the science, which we all agree on, that the vast majority of students will not show symptoms, even with the Delta, uh, at least initially, what that, means, what that means is, is that you then have to test every student in the school once a week, as well as every staff member and teacher. CPS has refused to do this. They have agreed finally in negotiations with the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, to test every teacher. That's, that's good. Uh, they are going to test uh, every staff member. Uh, they probably negotiated that with SEIU, Local 73, but they refused to test every student. So what the uh, Superintendent Butner did in Los Angeles between Thanksgiving and Christmas, he tested 35,000 um, asymptomatic students. This is when the schools were closed. So he opened up the campuses because Los Angeles has nicer weather and bigger uh, amount of land and invited parents to bring their kids. And one third of those kids, 12,000 kids tested positive who were asymptomatic. What's important about that? Well, those kids who the mayor says, uh, and Mr. Torres, the new CEO, uh, interim CEO of the uh, Chicago Public Schools says, uh, those kids uh, are safe to go to school. No, it's not safe for them or anybody because if they go to school and they already have COVID or they get it there and they're not symptomatic, the amount of virus of anyone, a child or adult, in our noses and mouth and upper airways is the same, is the same whether you're symptomatic or not, whether you're sick or not. So they can transmit that to other students, to staff, and also to the teachers. Why is that important? One third of all adults working in schools in the United States, including Chicago, have one or more underlying medical condition that makes them incredibly vulnerable to COVID. Now this is before COVID Delta. And as you know, COVID Delta is nine to 10 times more communicable, more transmissible than the other COVID. That's why it's so dangerous. So, and we have more and more breakthrough uh, infections of people who have both already been vaccinated and already had Delta. I uh, already had COVID, I'm sorry. So that's, that's what's really important. So that was number one. Then on May 1st, the same superintendent who unfortunately retired June 30th, made a commitment in Los Angeles to offer vaccines between 11 in the morning and seven at night so that workers in the first, second and third shift could go there with their kids, but anybody could go there to every student in every high school and every middle school. Los Angeles has lots of middle schools. Chicago has very few. So that means all the kids 12 to 18. And they vaccinated tens of thousands of kids. Do you know how many schools were opened by the Chicago Public Schools for walk-in vaccines? Three. Three schools opened four hours a week this entire summer. Three schools opened four hours a week, nine to one. How many people how many students were vaccinated by the Chicago Public School? Right out of the mouth of Mr. Torres at an in-person Board of Education meeting on July 28th, when we were there, people's response to testify, he proudly said Chicago Public Schools had vaccinated 245 students, 245 students. That's an absolute crime against humanity. So that's the question of vaccines. Now we have to talk about the other questions and then I'll answer your question. So there has to be testing of everyone in school once a week. No one should be in school of any age who is not fully vaccinated, which means two weeks after your last shot, whatever shot you got. That's not what CPS is doing. They're allowing students to uh, come in unvaccinated who are over 12 and over they are giving teachers too much time and staff. It shouldn't be October 15th. It should have been probably September 15th or September 30th when they came up with that deadline two weeks ago. That's way too long. 
there's going to be thousands of people get infected because of that. Uh, then, then is the question, so that's testing and that's vaccination. Then there's the major question at, that Paul raised of social distancing. Uh, on July, uh, 9, July 7th of 2020 last year, 279 of the world's leading scientists um, on the question of transmission of infectious disease and engineers wrote the largest sign-on letter in history to the World Health Organization, explaining that this disease is transmitted. In fact, now we know it's mostly transmitted, not in large droplets within six feet of people sneezing and coughing, but in small, tiny aerosol uh, uh, particles that can travel 30 feet or more just by eating and talking. Singing, it's 60 feet, just by eating and talking. Within, within a couple of weeks, WHO agreed with that position. You know when the United States Centers for Disease Control agreed with that position? A couple months ago this year. And despite that, Dr. Walensky said, everybody can take off their mask who's not vaccinated on May 13th. That's a deadly decision. Then she said, made more deadly guidelines in the schools by saying, we're gonna shrink it from six feet to three feet of distance between each, each person, which is called social distancing formally. But then, then a couple of weeks later, she said, well, if you can't do three feet, do whatever you can. And that's exactly what CPS is doing now. Then we're gonna to go to the question of air uh, because this disease is so easily transmitted, but even with the original COVID, and I, I hope your listeners understand that now every single infection for the last few weeks is Delta. There is no more original alpha or other forms of COVID. It's gone, it's been wiped out by Delta, okay? So every single infection since probably August 1st is now Delta in the United States and most other places in the world, although there's some new other variants. So the importance of this is then the question of, of air ventilation. And so there is a science for decades on this that is led by the engineers with doctorate degrees and master's degree from ASHRA, which is the Association of HVAC, Heating, Ventilation, Air Conditioner Engineers. And they say very clearly, any indoor space has to have six fresh room air changes per hour, plus HEPA filters. What did Chicago do in most other school systems, including New York? Number one is they spent millions and millions of dollars on filters that are not HEPA filters. They're not certified to be able to do the job against any infectious disease, especially COVID. So they now have those HEPA filters in most rooms and they're worthless because they're not certified. We have no idea if they're effective and the company refuses to put any evidence on their website. That's number one. Number two is all school systems, including the Chicago Public Schools, are not using the scientifically proven data of six uh, fresh room air changes per hour. They're saying one to two. And so they're standing on that as of right now, and they refuse to allow any unions in this country, including the Chicago Teachers Union, who have tried, or the, the, um, the SEIU Local 73, to come in and verify even one to two fresh air changes. So these are incredibly deadly things to be reopening schools. And the last thing I'll say, and there's a lot of other things to say, is that instead of doing what it said it was going to do a year ago by getting rid of Aramark, the, the, the worst company in the world to do housekeeping and hire just people who are CPS employees under the control, direct control of that public agency, they went ahead and expanded and increased the contract to Aramac um, three weeks ago and voted it in at the board meeting, uh, I think it was July 28th. So there is no way that schools are safe to reopen next Monday. There is no way anywhere in the United States that schools are safe to reopen. And there is no way that any child under 12 in school or even in daycare is safe until they can get vaccinated. Now, we hope that the vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds will be approved by the FDA in a few weeks, but we don't know yet. Um, today's approval 
from uh, emergency use to regular use is a step in that direction, but we don't know how much longer it is. And the reason for that relates to what Paul and I have been talking about. In 1998, until that date, the entire history of the Food and Drug Administration was to have hundreds of its own scientists and laboratories to do all the testing on any new drugs or vaccines. Uh, President William Jefferson Clinton, who privatized and deregulated more of the federal government than all presidents combined before and after, destroyed that with the privatization of the FDA. What that meant was, is that now people sit on scientific boards for the last 23 years who have direct financial relationships with one or more drug companies. And that's why all the vaccines and all the drugs are not independently tested by the FDA. They're all getting the data from this company who makes them. Does that sound like a little bit of conflict of interest? Um, and this has been going on for 23 years under every Democratic and Republican administration. So what that means is the drug companies did a terrible job of in their trials, phase one, phase two, and particularly phase three, of including children. So that's why this whole process of younger kids is being delayed. The FDA, to their credit, two months ago told the uh, drug companies they now have to double the number of kids in the trials. Um, we don't know publicly where that's at, but I can tell you we'll be lucky if in September it's opened up to five to 11 year olds. And then the question is, where are you gonna get them vaccinated? So we get back to the schools. So here's an answer to your question. Um, in terms of the testing, the, the, the testing is pretty much, pretty much um, it's not equivalent. The testing is much cheaper at the state level. Um, so the city used to have its own laboratory right here in the Daly Center um, until it abolished it in the 1980s before Mayor Washington was alive, uh, became the pre uh, mayor. Um, and so then it, it, it sent everything to the state laboratory there are three state laboratories, one in Chicago, one in Springfield, one in Carbondale. The state had actually closed down or partially closed the, the Springfield and Carbondale labs until COVID and an emergency basis it reopened them. Uh, those labs have had drastic cuts of dozens and dozens of scientists and laboratory techs, drastic cuts to their equipment. And in no way are they still a year and a half or more able to process as many tests as they do. So therefore, the state and the county and the city have been forced to depend on the two largest capitalist monopoly companies, uh, Quest and LabCorp, who take their time doing tests, who limit capacity, who refuse, literally refuse over the weekend to report their data to any state or city. So the weekend data is totally out of whack. And then you see a big jump on Monday because of that. So if the tests were all done, by the state laboratories or the city laboratory, they would be cheaper, more efficient, and faster turnaround. Now, on contact tracing, this is the first time in history that contact tracing has been privatized in the last decade. And contact tracing is not just for epidemics and pandemics, it's for every major infectious disease, for example, sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV. What happened was uh, in the last decade under Mayor Emanuel is that Commissioner Julie Moriarty, uh, again, uh, who basically uh, helped with further destruction of the Chicago Department of Health, uh, got a waiver from Governor Rauner through Mayor Emanuel to for the first time in history, privatize contact tracing to Howard Brown uh, Clinic. Um, and basically that's continued. So. In the last few years under uh, Emanuel and then Lightfoot, um, every single aspect of contact tracing and diagnosis has been privatized uh, to Howard Brown, University of Illinois and other private facilities. Uh, so that left the city in a terrible position uh, when the pandemic started. And instead of hiring hundreds of contact tracers like Cook County did, they hired 300 uh, at $20 an hour minimum full-time with benefits and AFSCME membership in a union. The city privatized it to 30 small, to 30 community-based organizations. 
who literally did an average of one person a day, one person at eight hours was contact tracing while the county was doing five to 25 per day with public contact tracers. So contact tracing has been more expensive in the private sector. And the last thing I'll say is that it's not just smaller or community-based organizations. One of the best known um, people in health is Dr. Paul Farmer from Harvard who started Partners in Health over 20 years ago. Uh, Dr. Farmer has gotten hundreds of millions of dollars from people like Bill Gates to build a system in countries like Haiti instead of helping rebuild the public health system, which was completely destroyed almost by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and structural adjustment programs. And now he has started to do the same thing in the United States with a takeover of public health functions, starting with the complete state of Massachusetts contact tracing contract. So it's not just smaller nonprofit industrial complex, it's the mar larger ones uh, like Partners in Health. And uh, what about uh, in Los Angeles, when uh, during for that efficient uh, vaccinations and um, uh, no uh, testing, was that uh, a public effort instead of uh, privatized? Yes. Yeah, so Los Angeles uh, has the greatest number of nurses uh, still left in schools. I actually was a physician consultant for the Los Angeles Unified School District in the 80s when they used to have doctors in the schools. Um, so Los Angeles actually has more nurses in New York. Uh, this was a combination, which is what it should be in Chicago, of nurses who work directly for Los Angeles Unified School District and nurses and nursing assistants who work for the Los Angeles County Health Department. Um, the city of Los Angeles combined its health department with the county uh, almost 50 years ago. Now, what should happen now in Chicago, and also Los Angeles is the only major school district now as of last week uh, to make the commitment to test every single student now every week. And that's what Chicago should do. But right now these schools are not safe to open, but when they are open, testing has to happen every week. Can the COVID Delta variant exist in a person incubating and COVID testing not be able to detect the COVID infection? Yes. So um, it's possible in the first couple of days, particularly with the rapid test, which we don't recommend in most cases, but it's effective in some ways, like at airports or whatever. Um, the, the viral load uh, initially may not be high enough, although it's important to understand the viral load goes up tremendously much more quicker in Delta in people than it did in the older form of COVID. Um, so testing every week is key. Um, even though it may miss a few people. Uh, and then the question of financial support. You know, 91% of 350,000 CPS students are on the free or reduced lunch program. That means they're living at poverty or within 200% or so of the poverty line. Um, the last thing they need to do is to stay home from work to take care of their kids for two weeks in quarantine or isolation without direct financial support from CPS in the city of Chicago and state of Illinois. Don't forget, CPS got $2 billion, a lot of which it's already received and more coming. And the city got $2 billion new dollars since March to deal with COVID. And it's only going to spend, at this point, a quarter of that, $500 million. It refuses to spend the rest of it to meet the demands of the Chicago Teachers Union and the rest of us to put a nurse in every school, a, a counselor for mental health in every school, and a librarian. So this is a crisis that the city, the mayor, the school system is responding to exactly in the wrong way. The $1.5 billion that are left, could that be spent on vaccination? Yes. So for the first time in decades, I don't even remember if it was done before, on March 23rd, President Biden made an announcement in a press release you can still find on the White House webpage on March 23rd, that $500 million in emergency funding would be given directly to every school district in the country who accepted it to hire school nurses now. 
school nurses now to vaccinate kids. Okay, the, the commissioner of health, Dr. Arwaday, in this interview this week or last week, said she can't find nurses. Well, we have all kinds of nursing schools in Chicago. We have Malcolm X, we have the University of Illinois, the largest nursing school in North America, not just in the United States. We have DePaul. We have dozens of nursing schools in and around Chicago. Uh, I've talked to several of the deans or assistant deans. She's not, she's not reached out to them. I don't know who she's reached out to. So there are nurses available. The city is not gonna be able to compete against the private sector, but there are plenty of nurses who are African-American Latino who come from the neighborhoods hardest hit that would want to work in the schools, that would want to go into people's homes uh, to give vaccines. Who is in charge of determining whether or not to let them uh, uh, go to the schools uh, and the neighborhoods to give the vaccines? Yeah, well, as I'm going to let Paul describe our three-point ordinance called Take Vaccine to the People, but who's in charge of this is one person in particular in Chicago. That is Mayor Lori Lightfoot. She controls the Board of Education. She controls the Chicago Department of Public Health. And if Lori Lightfoot right now picks up her cell phone and has a call with Commissioner Arraday and with uh, interim super interim uh, CEO, I, I can't believe they use that word CEO, but anyway, I'm gonna say interim superintendent, uh, Dr. Torres and says, we're gonna start doing vaccines in the schools. Uh, that's how it would happen. She has the money. She doesn't want to use it. She wants to continue to privatize it. She wants to continue to cut back uh, CPS and Department of Health. The one but I'll let, I'll let Paul- The $1.5 yeah. billion dollars that uh, she has not spent on, uh, on COVID, uh, what, what, is she accountable to uh, uh, provide the information to the public of what uh, uh, how every dollar is spent and uh, what the rest of that $1.5 billion is dedicated to, or will be done. Yeah, so I want to make clear we're talking about two pots of money that overlap, but there are two different pots of money. The city received $2 billion or yeah. has received mo some or most of the $2 billion, okay? She has specifically said, and several aldermen, uh, including Byron Cicero Lopez, Jeanette Taylor have called her out. She wants to use most of that money to shore up the debt of the city. That's not what's needed right now. If she wants to shore up the debt of the city, she ought to implement the LaSalle Street financial tax, uh, which would which would raise $12 billion in one year if she wants to shore up the debt of the city. So that's number one. The second pot of money is another 2 billion, 1.9 to be exact billion, that is going directly to CPS. So she needs to use both pots of money to hire Lots of people, like we said, nurse in every school, counselor in every school, librarian in every school with the CPS money. Then she's got to hire hundreds of new public health nurses and thousands of other people that Paul will talk about in terms of our ordinance. What, what is happening now to the $1.9 million uh, billion dollars for CPS? And uh, is there is there um, a paper trail of uh, where that money is spent? Uh, we do not have a good paper trail that I'm aware of. Are they, I would suggest, to give, are they required to pay? Uh, is the mayor uh, well, required if they're required, to pay? They, they, they are required, uh, but it's hard to get to. I would suggest, you know, you you call uh, Board President Miguel de Valle of the Chicago Board of Education and CPS CEO, Dr. Uh, I think his name is Manuel Torres, and ask them. And then pick up the phone and call Lori Lightfoot and her budget director and ask her. I can tell you that in terms of, if you go on the CDC website for funding, it'll show you exactly how much money the state of Illinois and Chicago have gotten. Several billions of dollars, several billion, many billions. And it shows you in the general categories. Uh, we are starting to FOIA the city for every single dollar. And now we're gonna FOIA CPS. We don't have that data yet. Um, and I can't believe that re good re reporters are not finding that out. Uh, I mean, we know that money went for the Chicago Police Department last year, but we don't know where this new money is going other than to say, shore up the debt. That means putting it down a black hole. So you said that uh, part of that money is going to the city and the other part of the money is going to Cook County or the state? You went a little bit too no, fast. No, 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 no. There's $2 billion for the city of Chicago. Right. 
And there's another $1.9 billion for the Chicago Public Schools. I don't know the number for, this, for the state or the county. So this government, the federal government, funds directly the city, it funds directly the state, and it funds directly the county. So those are, those are three different government entities. And you'd have to, uh, I don't know the numbers for the county and the state. And you are foiling all the, uh, the paper trail about how the money is spent. Yeah, we're starting that process this week. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paul, go ahead. Um, uh, first of all, what, how, uh, uh, I'll briefly address the take the vaccine to the people ordinance as Howard asked me to, and then I want to come back to the schools uh, for just a second. Um, the um, take the vaccine to the people ordinance was proposed in March by Alderman Byron Cicho Lopez. Um, before too long, it had, um, uh, I think, 12 or 13 uh, co-sponsors. Um, but didn't have a majority of the city council. And um, uh, uh, an alderman um, uh, who is not um, uh, very caring about marginalized people and people of color named Sposito, um, uh, uh, probably in league with the mayor, has that ordinance bottled up in a, in a rules committee. Um, but what the ordinance would do would be um, to... Um, it would dovetail very nicely with what we subsequently demanded about the schools. It would set up um, easily accessible, walk up friendly, don't need a car, um, walking distance from everybody's house within a square mile of everybody's house uh, vaccination sites, public schools, park district field houses, all kinds of public um, uh, uh, properties. Um, uh, and those vaccination centers would be staffed by public health nurses and nursing assistants, uh, and people would just get vaccinated uh, with no fuss and no muss and no problems. But it would also form um, community health brigades and workplace health brigades um, that would kind of be a troika situation of a public health nurse and a, a nursing assistant and a community worker in each in, in each of those little brigades. And those brigades would then not only staff um, um, the vaccination centers, but would go door to door and block to block um, to inform people um, uh, about uh, uh, the vaccine. And as I said before, it would really blow away this whole smoke screen of uh, people are hesitant. Um, because people would be hearing from their peers, from the people they respect, and it would be done in a systematic way. Um, and we need that ordinance. Now, I just want to come back to the schools for a second, um, because I think uh, I, what I'm hoping, it's been a lot of information, but I'm hoping your listeners, uh, those tuning into this, have a sense of what's wrong with the city and the Board of Education's response and what a real people's response, a real plan um, to, to take this pandemic in hand uh, and make the schools safe and make our children safe, what that would be. I just wanna to come to a minute because I don't think we should shy away from anything. We need to confront things head on honestly. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, ink been spilled um, various pediatricians, this one, that one, um, uh, on how damaging it is to do online education and how desperately we need to get back to in-person instruction. You know, myself, uh, my, uh, my uh, pedagogical, I've done teaching, my pedagogical tool of choice would be in person and not online. But aside from the fact that the first thing you have to do is have your kid alive and healthy if you want your kid to, be, to have an education and have a future. If we, you know, it, that's a given. So we have to have online education um, uh, until it's really safe uh, to open the schools and until we've gotten the uh, situation under control. Um, but I also wanna uh, raise the question for a minute what's really the most important thing? What's the most important thing for our kids to be educated? 
I think that in the context of living through this pandemic, that um, our kids need to get an understanding of that history of public health um, that Howard was talking about. People need to get an understanding of what collective responsibility for health um, is. People need to get an understanding of what community health is. And if our kids got that understanding to a uh, 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 well-developed curriculum on time, uh, our kids become the most powerful messengers of the need for everyone to get vaccinated to put on those masks. Nobody would be a stronger messenger, messenger than the kids. And I think that the Board of Education and the mayor is simply blind to what's really important. What's really important. If we were mobilizing as a society to defeat, to really take on this pandemic, we would understand that. And our children would become the main ambassadors, the main instructors of the whole community um, for public health. And they would gain a knowledge of history. They would gain a knowledge of science. They would gain a knowledge of medicine. And they would have the basis, in many cases, to pursue careers in public health. Um, and so I think we just need to get into perspective what is really important. Okay, Howard. Um, yes. Well, thank, thank you, thank you, uh, Paul, for that. Howard, uh, since we were, since Paul was uh, mentioning about um, the remote learning and uh, in-person learning, so CPS is responsible for determining uh, whether or not uh, and how much so uh, kids are going to be participating in uh, in in-person learning, right? Well, no, not exactly. Well, it's it's a combination of the Illinois Board. Illinois State Board of Education, ISBE, and CPS. So unfortunately, uh, the decision by both of them is wrong. Um, the decision by ISBE and the superintendent of schools for the state uh, laid down a heavy hand uh, two months ago. And I, I wanna just, you know, and Paul can explain this also, because uh, we I think we do a good job of complimenting each other. This all happened because a lot of it happened because of the CDC, what we call missed guidelines, uh, deadly guidelines, dangerous guidelines. Once they said people vaccinated could take off masks, once they said you can cut down social distancing from six feet to three feet to nothing if you can't do it, which is all in writing on the CDC's website, that gave the green light to every capitalist company to tell their people to take off masks, to tell the clients to take off masks, but it also gave the green light to school systems in blue states like Illinois to say that every single student is going to have to go back to school in person unless they have a medical reason. Um, that has not yet been challenged in court. I don't think it's gonna happen before next Monday, but what did happen now is CPS created something called Virtual Academy, uh, which is this incredibly convoluted um, system that's very hard to actually go through, even if you're totally computer literate. And they have like two categories of diseases uh, and you know mental health and physical health conditions that your kids could qualify for this academy. And there's there's, you know, 30, 25, 30,000 kids, there's 10% of the kids qualify, but only a few hundred have applied. Uh, first of all, kids don't know about it. So for example, the most common disease that in the world and, and in the United States and Chicago about why kids miss school is asthma. Uh, that's not a guaranteed exemption to get into the virtual academy. Um, so the whole process is totally anti-student, um, anti-parent, and particularly if you're African-American Latino and you're working class and you don't have good access to the internet, which tens of thousands of students still don't have, 
um, you know, you're not going to be able to get this. So there have been several parents who are African American and Latino who have publicly, uh, one was on a WBEZ report, I think August 3rd, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name now, said, I have the right, I want the right to decide whether my kids should go to school or not. Her kids do not primarily have underlying conditions, but she's afraid to send her children to school because she understands COVID Delta, especially kids under 12. So that's what we're calling for, is that people have a democratic right, the right of self-determination to decide this for themselves and their children. This is an incredibly serious decision. You know, we have a four-year-old granddaughter in Wisconsin, and for months we've been telling our son, uh, her, her father, that she should not go to school. I mean, I have two CPS grandchildren who are fully vaccinated, and I've told my daughter that even though they're fully vaccinated, they shouldn't go to school for the reasons that Paul, you know, dramatically explained when I got on this call, and that is we are now in the hundreds, probably thousands of kids who had no symptoms, who a couple weeks later start getting long COVID. Uh, I don't want to see my grandkids get that. So I've advised my daughter to not send her kids to school. I know it's emotionally traumatic. I, you know, I'd love to have my kids play with other kids, you know, socialize with other kids. But, but we have this thing called primordial DNA and the strongest primordial DNA that we have built into our system since three and a half million years ago when we got up and walked in East Africa is basically this. We will protect our children at all costs. We will protect our children at all costs. The schools are unsafe to open. There is already just in Mississippi, 30,000 kids in Mississippi and 50,000 kids in Florida who are quarantined and isolated just for the last few weeks of, of schools being open. Okay. Uh, thanks, Marco. Uh, this is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. We have with us on Wizard, Dr. Howard Ehrman, uh, and also Paul Siegel, both of whom have uh, various expertise and are discussing school safety and uh, COVID. Uh, Paul, uh, you mentioned uh, the virtual uh, academy. So uh, the only uh, people who are, uh, only students that are allowed to uh, attend the virtual academy have to have uh, underlying conditions. Is that what you meant? That is, that's my understanding. Uh, Howard specified that and that uh, I certainly read it um, in the papers and I've heard it from Howard and others. And it's, ter and, and even uh, as Howard said, you can have asthma, which is, just the worst, one of the worst things you could have is an underlying condition and still not get in. Right. It just doesn't make sense. Five to 11 year olds are completely unvaccinated. 12 to 18 year olds are two thirds unvaccinated. Um, how can you, and they're not even committed to real social distancing and they're not committed to what it would really take to make the air clean. Howard, God, who's Howard. Howard. Howard, who is Howard, who is a Howard? Who is accountable if there is a COVID outbreak because of this policy? Uh, who's accountable is first of all Governor J. P. Pritzker, because the, the the Illinois State Board of Education does have some absolute authority every school uh, over every school district. So Pritzker has gotten away with all kinds of horrible mistakes that he's made uh, because he's a smooth talker. And he comes off kind of like in a positive way. But there's nothing positive about the way he's handled this pandemic. Uh, ask the governor next time you talk to him, how many nursing homes did he go in and inspect uh, when there was great evidence of mismanagement that caused the deaths of hundreds of residents and workers? That's one of the reasons SEIU went on strike. How many meatpacking plants? Illinois has the fourth highest number of meatpacking plants. Did he go into to stop dozens of people dying, including neighbors across the street from my house in Little Village? So ask him those questions and ask him, why did his person, the Illinois State Board of Education director, say that every student has to go back to school when it's not safe for students to go back to school? So that, that's who's responsible. Secondarily, of course, is Lightfoot. Okay. 
And then does CPS have tracking on whom among teachers, staff, and eligible students 12 years and old, uh, older are vaccinated? Terrible tracking. Um, you know, this has been a kind of constant thing between CPS and CTU, Chicago Teachers Union. I don't know about SEIU, but probably the Chicago Teachers Union has better data uh, on their own 25,000 members. Uh, and they both say about 80%, maybe 85%. Um, so. 80 to 85% uh, are, 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 are what now? Are already vaccinated. Well, that's, that's great for the teachers. Um, of course, nobody should be in this building on Monday. Nobody who's not fully vaccinated. That means two weeks since the last vaccine. Nobody should be in that building, you know, and they shouldn't be there anyway because the ventilation is poor and they're not doing social distancing. And Aramark is making sure that they stay dirty. So for nobody the, should be in there. Yes, and for the uh, filters, since the filters are, are not uh, up to par and, and if people do get uh, sick or die from COVID because of those filters. Again, uh, so it's uh, Lightfoot who is responsible for CPS, are you saying? Yes, and because as far as I know, we still don't have an elected school board for another six years. So Lightfoot is directly responsible. Lightfoot appoints uh, President of IA and all the other board members. So she's directly responsible. You know, those board members don't, could have, could have overseen this process. Um, with uh, Janice Jackson, the previous CEO, who spent all this money on filters that are not HEPA certified, but she didn't do that. Yes, uh, and then uh, for if people were to die from the from from COVID because of the uh, her decision, uh, is there anything uh, legally that she is responsible for, uh, or is it just that uh, she? Uh, uh, might not lead, uh, win an election. Is there anything that uh, she has to uh, uh, account for uh, legally uh, if uh, if that's were be to be uh, happening on her watch and uh, Governor Pritzker's watch? Well, I think I think certainly um, the most important thing, like Paul has been saying and we've been saying, and I I just want to also make sure before we leave that Paul and I are are part of the People's Response Network. That's a network. Uh, we meet every Wednesday at five o'clock. You have the link. So if you could somehow put that up there, um, you know, in the chat or whatever. So we welcome everybody. Um, we don't just talk, we plan actions. So this week um, there is a major action uh, Thursday at 9.30 at O'Keefe Elementary School in South Shore by planned and done by South Shore members of our organization, the People's Response Network. But yes, what should happen is a mass movement first, and then um, people file a class action suit, which unfortunately could take years. But you know, the best thing would be to get an emergency ruling from a judge who knows something about public health to stop the governor and stop the mayor from opening the schools. Now we think it would be much better if the Chicago Teachers Union was part of that. <laughs> they have the numbers, they have the money, they have the power, along with SEIU, Local 73, who represents all the non-teachers uh, who are not privatized, to do this. Uh, we, we would love to join. We would yeah, love to join with them. And we've, they... we've been proposing uh, working together for over a year, but that hasn't happened. So is CTU uh, considering a, a lawsuit for, for this then? Or, or uh, I have no, no, I have no idea. No, no, I have no idea. I said it would be better if there is going to be a lawsuit to do it all together as a class action suit. I have okay. no idea what CTU right now is thinking other than, you know, they are explaining that, you know, the mayor and her negotiating team through CPS are not bargaining in good faith for the most part. And, and we agree there, with that. And are there any precedents in the, uh, in, in the country of, uh, of the course, actually citing and holding public officials responsible for COVID deaths? Um, that's a good question. I honestly do not know the answer if there's legal precedence for that. Well, uh, there, uh, was, there was, there was um, uh, a legal thing that happened. I don't remember it right now because I haven't taught this course in a while in public health school. So in, um, in 1918, 
at a war bond, there were two war bond parades. I think it was on Veterans Day in St. Louis and Philadelphia. Um, and I think it was Philadelphia. I think one, so one of the cities canceled the parade and the other one didn't. And the city that didn't cancel the parade had like hundreds of people die within a day or two. Philadelphia. Because, yeah, yeah. Philadelphia. So Philadelphia, um, so we have to remember that this flu uh, of 1918 was much more deadly even than COVID is. Mm -hmm. So people would literally, I mean, there were dozens of people who fell dead just in, in, in the crowd of during the parade. I mean, this is a true story. Yes. It's documented in Jan, Jan Berry's book, uh, The Great Influenza. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lawsuit uh, against the mayor, but I honestly don't remember what happened to that lawsuit. Mm -hmm. but, but I think what's really important here, like Paul can elaborate on, because I'm going to go underground in a minute and lose cell coverage, um, is basically that the mass movement is what's the most important thing to force these public officials. Yes. Well, if uh, if there the mass movement, so that uh, they're uh, concerned that they might not win re-election, is that what the mass movement is about? No, the mass movement. The mass movement means that the parents, the students, the teachers, and the staff people all need to go on strike next Monday at eight o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. say no mm -hmm. school until safe schools. That's that's what a mass movement means. Every single school is shut down before it reopens. That's a mass movement. And how many uh, do, do you have a gauge on how many on how many parents and how many people in the community are with you on this? Well, I would say um, I, I don't think people are. Most people are at that point yet. I think what people are at is feeling extremely nervous. Having major anxiety and depression on top of anxiety and depression they had before this, because they know it's not right to send their kids back to school, but they know they can't afford to lose their jobs. So this is a huge problem. Uh, and of course, what should happen is that the government should pay them to stay at home to take care of their kids, but that, for the most part, has never happened. Um, so that's the solution, right? Is you pay people at least. Twenty dollars an hour to stay home with their kids. <laughs> that's that's what has to happen. But, but won't. that's not that's not what's happening. So I think there are going to be at least several thousand, particularly African American and Latino parents, who will not send their kids to school next Monday. I don't know the number. I don't want to guesstimate. Mm -hmm. But I can just tell you from going to schools. By the way, People's Response Network started going to schools directly this last week. And Paul can talk about that. We are going to schools at least every day that are having back to school events. And we're talking to parents and handing them our flyer about why it's not safe to reopen schools. Uh, we're not trying to dictate to the parents. We respectfully listen to them, but we're also gonna be honest about why it's completely unsafe, whether your kid's vaccinated or not, but particularly for kids under 12. Do you have a major media coverage of your uh, of your work? I'm going to let Paul answer the rest of this because I'm going to be going underground. But thank you so much, Trudy. Um, really appreciate your time and look forward to working with you in the future. And please stay safe and uh, wear your mask anytime you go inside and even a lot of times outside. Yes, that's what I do. Thank you so much, Howard, for for all your information and your time. Yeah, Howard. Huh? Did you uh, say that? Yes. Uh, well, uh, mass media coverage has not been terribly plentiful. Um, we've uh, the People's Response Network um, uh, is uh, well. I like to call it lean and mean. We're small, um, but we uh, we get the word out as best we can, um, and we get uh, people from various communities involved. And now we're going to the schools. We're fine. I, I found. At Sen High School, where I was, uh, where they had a kind of big mass orientation center uh, session, um, uh, when I went with our uh, school demands and talked to uh, every parent and student that came, and it was 
few hundred people uh, that people were grateful to get the information, including the teenage high school kids um, who um, took it quite seriously. I didn't hear any kind of uh, teenage wisecracks about this old fogey Paul Siegel out there with his leaflet. They wanted they wanted the information. So, mm. in you know, in, in you know, what I would say to you is, I throw it back to everybody out there listening. Um, um, what I like to say, it goes back to something um, in that those Black Lung Association days when we formed a. A coalition around occupational disease of brown lung, white lung, and black lung victor, victims, textile workers, asbestos workers, and coal workers, um, uh, that each of us, even that the very people who are threatened with not being able to breathe at night, um, as we are now threatened by COVID in that way, are the ones who are going to breathe life into the country. In other words, each of us should become a people's respirator. Get involved with the People's Response Network. Get involved with the union. Take it to your church. Um, we have got to create a mass movement um, uh, that will uh, make things happen. That's the only way that change has ever happened. It's the only way that change ever will happen. Um, and that um, would be the last word I'd want to leave people with. Um, it's up to each of us. We've got to each breathe some, take on the responsibility to breathe some life into a city and a country that's badly, badly in need. We since have there is not much time before, public. since there is not much time before the reopening of schools, that's why we asked about uh, whether uh, you approach the news media so that the word could get out there faster. Yeah. Have you tried, have you tried uh, contacting all the major news outlets concerning yeah, this? Yeah, we've had several press conferences and we're going to have another one. Um, uh, we anticipate uh, in South Shore this coming week uh, and we always notify the press and we've gotten some coverage off of it. Um, uh, any help you want to give us <laughs> with the mass media? Got any contacts? Let us know. Um, have you found that uh, after after you get the uh, media coverage, do you get more support and more? Uh, is there a better response, and then uh, more people know about the yeah. your you what you're build, doing? You got to build it one grain of sand at a time. We're always behind. You know, the nature of this crisis is we are indeed always kind of behind. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a time to catch up, but I hope it's sooner rather than later. Um, I'm one person, I can do what I can, but um, uh, yeah, mass uh, coverage in the mass media certainly would help. It would help create awareness. I think uh, most important, actually, more important than the mass media is the grassroots people-to-people -people contact in the neighborhoods, in the communities, at the schools. Um, people need to talk to other parents. Um, I can tell you from what I've seen going to some schools, there is a hunger for knowledge. There is a fear that the truth isn't being told. There is a feeling that the Board of Education and the mayor don't have a real plan. There's a great concern for the safety of the children. That is out there. Um, we've got to build, uh, build on that and show um, that something can really be done. As I said before, this just didn't have, this is a true Shakespearean tragedy. This did not have to be. Once we had that vaccine, we could have moved decisively in the ways that How Howard was talking about. We beat polio in this country. When I was nine years old, I was vaccinated in my school, every school, and every kid got vaccinated and there was, and that was it. And we beat polio. That's what we could have done with COVID. Instead, we left about millions of people unvaccinated and gave that opportunistic virus um, the chance to evolve into something worse, something worse that now threatens even those that are vaccinated. It's not too late, like the environmental crisis, but we got to move. We got to move. How much uh, man manpower, how much uh, help do you have uh, among your organizations? Uh, how how widely spread are you um, in the city, in the wards? Which wards are you able to cover and which wards are you not well, able to I, cover? Well, you know, um, 
it's not uh, nearly what we would want it to be. I'm not going to BS you. Um, but, um, you know, you move on, uh, you know, you, you try to move on some base areas. So in Uptown and Little Village in Pilsen, um, uh, now um, we're seeing it uh, in, in South Shore. Um, people are starting to talk to each other. They're starting to talk to their neighbors. And of course, there's things uh, along those lines going on that we don't even know about. Um, uh, so um, you try to build a, uh, build a base in a community uh, in, and then in several communities, and then uh, you try to spread it. Um, and that's what we've got to do. That's what we've been trying to do. Um, and that's what we'll continue to do. Um, we'll do everything we can. And I, again, throw it back to your audience to get involved. Um, uh, if you can uh, somehow make that uh, link to the chat, you know, to the Wednesday meetings available to people who watch this, that would be really great. And if you could send us a copy of the recording you made, uh, we can, I'm sure we can use it. Yes, of course. For the, uh, when did you start uh, the activism about uh, uh, the danger of returning to schools? As soon as the news came out that the schools would be reopening? Oh yeah, uh, what's the we've timeline? actually been talking about that since before the latest news. Um, I think that we played some role um, uh, in, in, in getting uh, the schools to be shut down before when they were earlier in the pandemic. Um, uh, the city was very hesitant and reluctant on that. Um, uh, so yeah, we've been um, agitating around the schools since oh, the spring, since early spring. Mm -hmm. Early spring of uh, the, er the pandemic last year or early spring this year? Um, I, I, even, even last year, yes, mm -hmm. even last year, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul. Paul Siegel, community activist and uh, voice of the community. And what was the organization, the uh, People's Action? For People's Response Network. Response and I'm Network. Also a founding yeah. member of Northside Action for Justice and yes. uh, in Voice of the People. And um, I have a PhD in history from UIC, which I got in advanced middle age. Um, uh, and did some uh, history of uh, displacement in Uptown. Mm -hmm. okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Paul Siegel, so much for uh, joining us at Wizard today to discuss COVID and school safety. Keep safe, and we might uh, speak to you again. Thank you very much. This is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM.